The Devil in Manuscript by Nathaniel Hawthorne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alex Clark. The Devil in Manuscript by Nathaniel Hawthorne. On a bitter evening of December, I arrived by mail in a large town which was then the residence of an intimate friend, one of those gifted youths who cultivate poetry and the belles lettres, and call themselves students at law. My first business, after supper, was to visit him at the office of his distinguished instructor. As I have said, it was a bitter night, clear starlight, but cold as Nova Zembla, the shop windows along the street being frosted so as almost to hide the lights while the wheels of coaches thundered equally loud over frozen earth and pavements of stone. There was no snow either on the ground or the roofs of the houses. The wind blew so violently that I had but to spread my cloak like a mainsail and scud along the street at the rate of ten knots, greatly envied by other navigators who were beating slowly up with the gale right in their teeth. One of these I capsized but was gone on the wings of the wind before he could even vociferate an oath. After this picture of an inclement night, behold us, seated by a great blazing fire, which looked so comfortable and delicious that I felt inclined to lie down and roll among the hot coals. The usual furniture of a lawyer's office was around us. Rows of volumes in sheepskin, and a multitude of writs, summonses, and other legal papers scattered over the desks and tables. But there were certain objects which seemed to intimate that we had little dread of the intrusion of clients, or of the learned counselor himself, who, indeed, was attending court in a distant town. A tall, decanter-shaped bottle stood on the table, between two tumblers, and beside a pile of blotted manuscripts, altogether dissimilar to any law documents recognized in our courts. My friend, whom I shall call Oberon, it was a name of fancy and friendship between him and me. My friend Oberon looked at these papers with a peculiar expression of disquietude. I do believe, said he soberly, or at least I could believe, if I chose, that there is a devil in this pile of blotted papers. You have read them and know what I mean. That conception in which I endeavored to embody the character of a fiend, as represented in our traditions and the written records of witchcraft. Oh, I have a horror of what was created in my own brain, and shudder at the manuscripts in which I gave that dark idea a sort of material existence. Would they were out of my sight. And of mine, too, thought I. You remember continued Oberon, how the hellish thing used to suck away the happiness of those who, by a simple concession that seemed almost innocent, subjected themselves to his power. Just so my peace is gone, and all by these accursed manuscripts. Have you felt nothing of the same influence? Nothing, replied I, unless the spell be hid in a desire to turn novelist after reading your delightful tales. Novelist? exclaimed Oberon, half seriously. Then, indeed, my devil has his claw on you. You are gone. You cannot even pray for deliverance. But we will be the last and only victims. For this night I mean to burn the manuscripts and commit the fiend to his retribution in the flames. Burn your tails? repeated I, startled at the desperation of the idea. Even so, said the author despondingly. You cannot conceive what an effect the composition of these tales has had on me. I have become ambitious of a bubble and careless of solid reputation. I am surrounding myself with shadows which bewilder me by aping the realities of life. They have drawn me aside from the beaten path of the world and led me into a strange sort of solitude. A solitude in the midst of men where nobody wishes for what I do nor thinks nor feels as I do. The tales have done all this. When they are ashes, perhaps I shall be as I was before they had existence. Moreover, the sacrifice is less than you may suppose, since nobody will publish them. That 
does make a difference indeed, said I. They have been offered by letter, continued Oberon, reddening with vexation, to some seventeen booksellers. It would make you stare to read their answers, and read them you should, only that I burned them as fast as they arrived. One man publishes nothing but school books. Another has five novels already under examination. What a voluminous mass the unpublished literature of America must be, cried I. Oh, the Alexandrian manuscripts were nothing to it, said my friend. Well, another gentleman is just giving up business on purpose, I verily believe, to escape publishing my book. Several, however, would not absolutely decline the agency on my advancing half the cost of an edition and giving bonds for the remainder, besides a high percentage to themselves, whether the book sells or not. Another advises a subscription. The villain! exclaimed I. A fact! said Oberon. In short, of all the seventeen booksellers, only one has vouchsafed even to read my tales. And he, a literary dabbler himself, I should judge, has the impertinence to criticize them, proposing what he calls vast improvements, and concluding, after a general sentence of condemnation, with the definitive assurance that he will not be concerned on any terms. It might not be amiss to pull that fellow's nose, remarked I. If the whole trade had one common nose, there would be some satisfaction in pulling it, answered the author, but there does seem to be one honest man among those seventeen unrighteous ones, and he tells me fairly that no American publisher will meddle with an American work, seldom if by a known writer, and never if by a new one, unless at the writer's risk. The paltry rogues, cried I, will they live by literature and yet risk nothing for its sake? But, after all, you might publish on your own account. And so I might, replied Oberon, but the devil of the business is this. These people have put me so out of conceit with the tales that I loathe the very thought of them, and actually experience a physical sickness of the stomach whenever I glance at them on the table. I tell you, there is a demon in them. I anticipate a wild enjoyment in seeing them in the blaze, such as I should feel in taking vengeance on an enemy or destroying something noxious. I did not strenuously oppose this determination, being privately of opinion, in spite of my partiality for the author, that his tales would make a more brilliant appearance in the fire than anywhere else. Before proceeding to execution, we broached the bottle of champagne which Oberon had provided for keeping up his spirits in this doleful business. We swallowed each a tumblerful in sparkling commotion. It went bubbling down our throats and brightened my eyes at once, but left my friend sad and heavy as before. He drew the tails toward him with a mixture of natural affection and natural disgust, like a father taking a deformed infant into his arms. Pooh! Psh! Psha! exclaimed he, holding them at arm's length. It was Gray's idea of heaven to lounge on a sofa and read new novels. Now, what more appropriate torture would Dante himself have contrived for the sinner who perpetuates a bad book than to be continually turning over the manuscript? It would fail of effect, said I, because a bad author is always his own great admirer. I lack that one characteristic of my tribe, the only desirable one, observed Oberon. But how many recollections throng upon me as I turn over these leaves? This scene came into my fancy as I walked along a hilly road on a starlit October evening in the pure and bracing air. I became all soul and felt as if I could climb the sky and run a race along the Milky Way. Here is another tale in which I wrapped myself during a dark and dreary night ride in the month of March till the rattling of the wheels and the voices of my companions seemed like faint sounds of a dream and my visions a bright reality. That scribbled page describes shadows which I summoned to my bedside at midnight. They would not depart when I bade them. 
the Grey Dawn came and found me wide awake and feverish, the victim of my own enchantments. There must have been a sort of happiness in all this, said I, smitten with a strange longing to make proof of it. There may be happiness in a fever fit, replied the author, and then the various moods in which I wrote. Sometimes my ideas were like precious stones under the earth, requiring toil to dig them up and care to polish and brighten them, but often a delicious stream of thought would gush out upon the page at once like water sparkling up suddenly in the desert, and when it had passed, I gnawed my pen hopelessly or blundered on with cold and miserable toil as if there were a wall of ice between me and my subject. Do you now perceive a corresponding difference? inquired I, between the passages which you wrote so coldly and those fervid flashes of the mind? No, said Oberon, tossing the manuscripts on the table. I find no traces of the golden pen with which I wrote in characters of fire. My treasure of fairy coin is changed to worthless dross. My picture, painted in what seemed the loveliest hues, presents nothing but a faded and indistinguishable surface. I have been eloquent and poetical and humorous in a dream, and behold, it is all nonsense now that I am awake. My friend now threw sticks of wood and dry chips upon the fire, and seeing it blaze like Nebuchadnezzar's furnace, seized the champagne bottle and drank two or three brimming bumpers successively. The heady liquor combined with his agitation to throw him into a species of rage. He laid violent hands on the tails. In one instant more, their faults and beauties would alike have vanished in a glowing purgatory. But, all at once, I remembered passages of high imagination, deep pathos, original thoughts, and points of such varied excellence that the vastness of the sacrifice struck me most forcibly. I caught his arm. Surely you do not mean to burn them! I exclaimed. Let me alone! cried Oberon, his eyes flashing fire. I will burn them! Not a scorched syllable shall escape! Would you have me a damned author to undergo sneers, taunts, abuse, and cold neglect, and faint praise bestowed for pity's sake against the giver's conscience? A hissing and a laughing stock to my own traitorous thoughts? An outlaw from the protection of the grave? One whose ashes every careless foot might spurn, unhonored in life and remembered scornfully in death? Am I to bear all this when yonder fire will ensure me from the hole? No! There go the tales! May my hand wither when it would write another! The deed was done. He had thrown the manuscripts into the hottest of the fire, which at first seemed to shrink away, but soon curled round them and made them a part of its own fervent brightness. Oberon stood gazing at the conflagration, and shortly began to soliloquize in the wildest strain, as if fancy resisted and became riotous at the moment when he would have compelled her to ascend that funeral pile. His words described objects which he appeared to discern in the fire, fed by his own precious thoughts, perhaps the thousand visions which the writer's magic had incorporated with these pages became visible to him in the dissolving heat, bringing forth air they vanished forever. While the smoke, the vivid sheets of flame, the ruddy and whitening coals caught the aspect of a varied scenery. They blaze! said he, as if I had steeped them in the intensest spirit of genius. There I see my lovers clasped in each other's arms. How pure the flame that bursts from their glowing hearts. And yonder the features of a villain writhing in the fire that shall torment him to eternity. My holy men, my pious and angelic women stand like martyrs amid the flames, their mild eyes lifted heavenward. Ring out the bells! A city is on fire! See! Destruction roars through my dark forests while the lakes boil up in steaming bellows, and the mountains are volcanoes, and the sky kindles with a lurid brightness. All elements are but one pervading flame. Ha! The fiend! I was somewhat startled by this latter exclamation. The tales were almost consumed. 
but just then threw forth a broad sheet of fire, which flickered as with laughter, making the whole room dance in its brightness, and then roared potentiously up the chimney. You saw him? You must have seen him! cried Oberon, how he glared at me and laughed in that last sheet of flame with just the features that I imagined for him. Well, the tales are gone. The papers were indeed reduced to a heap of black cinders, with a multitude of sparks hurrying confusedly among them, the traces of the pen being now represented by white lines, and the whole mass fluttering to and fro in the drafts of air. The destroyer knelt down to look at them. What is more potent than fire? said he in his gloomiest tone. Even thought, invisible and incorporeal as it is, cannot escape it. In this little time, it has annihilated the creations of long nights and days, which I could no more reproduce in their first glow and freshness than cause ashes and whitened bones to rise up and live. There, too, I sacrificed the unborn children of my mind. All that I had accomplished, all that I planned for future years, has perished by one common ruin and left only this heap of embers. The deed has been my fate, and what remains? A weary and aimless life, a long repentance of this hour, and at last an obscure grave where they will bury and forget me. As the author concluded his dolorous moan, the extinguished embers arose and settled down, and arose again, and finally flew up the chimney like a demon with sable wings. Just as they disappeared, there was a loud and solitary cry in the street below us. Fire! Fire! Other voices caught up that terrible word, and it speedily became the shout of a multitude. Oberon started to his feet in fresh excitement. "'A fire on such a night?' cried he. "'The wind blows a gale, and wherever it whirls the flames, the roofs will flash up like gunpowder. Every pump is frozen up, and boiling water would turn to ice the moment it was flung from the engine. In an hour this wooden town will be one great bonfire. What a glorious scene for my next—' <laughs> The street was now all alive with footsteps, and the air full of voices— we heard one engine thundering round a corner, and another rattling from a distance over the pavements. The bells of three steeples clanged out at once, spreading the alarm to many a neighboring town, and expressing hurry, confusion, and terror so inimitably that I could almost distinguish in their peal the burden of the universal cry, FIRE! 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 What is so eloquent as their iron tongues? exclaimed Oberon. My heart leaps and trembles, but not with fear. And that other sound, too, deep and awful as a mighty organ, the roar and thunder of the multitude on the pavement below. Come, we are losing time. I will cry out in the loudest of the uproar and mingle my spirit with the wildest of the confusion and be a bubble on the top of the ferment. From the first outcry, my forebodings had warned me of the true object and center of alarm. There was nothing now but uproar, above, beneath, and around us. Footsteps stumbling pell-mell up the public staircase, eager shouts and heavy thumps at the door, the whiz and dash of water from the engines, and the crash of furniture thrown upon the pavement. At once the truth flashed upon my friend. His frenzy took the hue of joy, and, with a wild gesture of exultation, he leaped almost to the ceiling of the chamber. My tails! cried Oberon, the chimney, the roof, the fiend has gone forth by night and startled thousands in fear and wonder from their beds. Here I stand, a triumphant author. Huzzah! Huzzah! My brain has set the town on fire. Ha ha! End of The Devil in Manuscript <laughs>